Today's case is yet another story of a Leonardo da Vinci of mental manipulation, an American Thierry Tilly, my friends. Only this time, our villain was a person who was supposed to be there to help, a person who should have been there to listen, to give advice, and to make life better for people who are suffering. Today, I tell the story of how a regular old psychiatrist convinced a millionaire to hand over the keys to a mansion, plus a lot of his money, and then convinced this, well probably no longer millionaire to work or to appear as his handyman. I think that Marty's first mistake was trusting anyone named Dr. Ike, but maybe that's just me. Welcome to Capers and Cocktails, a true crime podcast that doesn't take itself too seriously and gives you something to enjoy while you listen. The following content may be disturbing to some. Discretion is advised. If you're enjoying one of our themed cocktails, ensure you're of legal drinking age and have fun, but drink responsibly. In the 1940s, Brooklyn-based Monarch Wine Company had some pretty entrepreneurial owners. They set out to create a kosher wine that the then 1.5 million Jewish immigrants living in New York City could enjoy, thereby sealing the deal as the Jewish wine producer. There was only one problem. No one gave one hoot about Monarch Wine. So executives approached the Manischewitz Company, a Cleveland-based business that was well-known for its kosher food. It was a simple licensing deal, and the companies shook hands on it. After sourcing Labrusca grapes from upstate New York, they were crushed and fermented under rabbinical supervision. But they were mass-producing this stuff, so... If you've ever had Menashevitz wine, you may be wondering why it's so sweet. Well, the answer is sugar. They were mass producing as much wine as possible, and they had to add sugar to the wine to ensure that it was, well, actually drinkable. That's why it sort of tastes like grape jelly and uh, has a hangover to match. But I will say it makes a pretty nice sangria. Sangrias are Spanish drinks made of wine, fruit, and something bubbly. For this sangria, you're going to need to make and prepare it at least in 24 hours in advance, but I think mine sat for about 48 hours before I drank it. So press pause after I give these instructions and I'll see you back here in 24 to 48 hours. My recipe has fruit I like, but you can substitute anything you'd prefer. Both of the drinks today have peaches, plums, and oranges, as well as we'll add some club soda right before we drink it. The cocktail has the Manischewitz, of course, in the classic and most well-known grape flavor. By the way, it costs about six bucks now. Inflation has also hit Manischewitz, but that's still pretty cheap. The mocktail replaces the alcohol with a bottle of grape juice. So you're going to take your base and put it into a jar or a pitcher, and then you'll add the fruits that you'd like. Um, You'll let it marinate in the fridge for 24 to 48 hours. Make sure you cut up the fruit before you put it into the drink. Then right before serving, you'll add some club soda. It's really just whatever it is to your taste. Measure with your heart, people. It was the perfect time in Martin Markowitz's life to be taken advantage of. It was June in 1981, and 39-year-old Marty was at a crossroads. A graduate of the Wharton School of Business and NYU Law, he had recently inherited his father's company, Associated Fabrics, a company founded by his father in 1928, after the deaths of both his father and his mother. According to the company's now defunct website, more on that later, Founded in 1928, AFC is today the world's largest theatrical fabric company. You'll find us not only at the Olympics, the Super Bowl, Mardi Gras, the Moscow Circus, the Rio Carnival, the Australian Skydiving Club, WrestleMania, and theme parks around the world, but also at your daughter's dance recital, your best friend's wedding, and in pettiskirts around the world. Marty's uncle had sued him in the previous year because he was unhappy that 50% of the company had been given to Marty. And Marty, who had been engaged, broke it off because the fiancé refused to sign a prenuptial agreement. Marty was unexpectedly and unpreparedly running a large company and was also an unexpected millionaire. It was a stressful time, and Marty felt overrun by responsibilities. Marty's rabbi, Shlomo Riskin, at the time Lincoln Square's synagogue's leader, listened patiently to Marty. He had already brought Marty closer to his faith, so Marty trusted him. Rabbi Riskin recommended that Marty see a psychiatrist, and in fact, he had one in mind. Dr. Isaac Hirschkopf was a psychiatrist in his late 20s. He graduated with an MD in psychiatry in 1975 from NYU's medical school. 
Dr. Ike was pompous and obsessed with status. He would constantly show off pictures of himself with celebrities, such as Gwyneth Paltrow, who was evidently a patient of Ike's for a while. Marty began seeing Dr. Ike three times per week. Yes, you heard that correctly. Three times a week. Six to seven hours a week. It was clear from the beginning that Ike was not your typical psychiatrist. He was known for taking Marty on walks around New York City and would often go with Marty to directly confront the sources of his problems. At first, this helped. Marty was gaining confidence in setting boundaries, something he'd struggled with during his adult life. But then, over the course of two years, Ike quietly and aggressively inserted himself into all aspects of Marty's life. Marty would say that he very quietly started pouring salt into my open wounds. The manipulation began almost immediately. Dr. Ike started by, in a classic move, isolating Marty from members of his family. As a therapeutic decision, he insisted that Marty have a second bar mitzvah in May of 1983. He told Marty not to invite his sister Phyllis or her children. Phyllis, Marty's younger sister by three years, also worked at the fabric company. Dr. Ike told Marty to serially lower her pay by $5,000, which he did several times. Dr. Ike would then insist that Phyllis be fired and disinherited from her family business, which Marty did. Dr. Ike drafted a letter that Marty would write saying, No one in the family would ever inherit any of my money and it was delivered by messenger to Phyllis's then 11-year-old daughter. If Phyllis ever contacted Marty for any reason, Marty was instructed to bring all of that communication in to Dr. Ike, and Dr. Ike would interpret it. Okay, sure. Dr. Ike even had him cut his sister out of all of the family photos. Dr. Ike also kept Marty from having any romantic relationships, convincing him that only Dr. Ike was to be trusted and no one else. Marty would say, he didn't let me have a girlfriend. I would go out on a date and he would call her a gold digger. He would say, everyone is out to get you. I'm going to protect you. And I was stupid enough to buy it. Naturally, this caused some estrangements. After Dr. Ike had successfully cut off his closest familial and friend relationships, he said to Marty, you don't have a family? Don't worry. My family will be your family. My kids like your nieces and nephews, and we're going to make a social life for you. And I suppose he did, sort of. In 1986, Dr. Ike convinced Marty to buy the house next to his Southampton summer home, after which he took over the house and moved Marty into the guest quarters. Dr. Ike went so far as to ban Marty from storing food in the main house. And bombastic Dr. Ike? Well, the guy liked to throw some serious parties. But first, the house had to be made party ready. At the direction of Dr. Ike, but funded by Marty, they put in a large pool with a slide, naturally, a full-size basketball court, a tennis court, and multiple ponds stocked with koi. There was also a hot tub and a professionally designed 18-hole mini golf course. Now ready to party, Dr. Ike would have Marty charter buses to bring between 70 and 170 people out to the house with a mailbox that bore the name Dr. Isaac Stevens, an alias that Dr. Ike used. The first of these legendary parties took place in June of 1987. Marty was to prepare the estate for each party, and during the party, he was responsible for manning the barbecue and serving the guests' kosher barbecue. Many people who attended the party attested to the fact that they thought Marty was hired help. Marty would later say, people thought I was the caretaker. In September of 1984, Dr. Ike convinced Marty to co-create a private foundation called the Yaron Foundation. He listed himself, Dr. Ike, and Dr. Ike's wife as officers and directors. This foundation was co-created by Ike and Marty, but Ike somehow never put any money into it. He did, however, draw money out of it. The psychiatrist used his money for donations to, among others, the Ramaz School, an elite Jewish school on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, which his three daughters attended. At the same time, at the behest of Dr. Ike, Marty would change his will to make the foundation the sole recipient of the entire estate, and he would give Dr. Ike not only power of attorney, but also make him sole executor of the will. 
Dr. Ike convinced Marty to list him as a co-owner of Marty's bank account, which at least at one point contained around $2.5 million. And then Dr. Ike set his sights on associated fabrics, with eyes on inserting himself into management decisions. Marty would say, a constant mantra from Ike was he'd say, you can't handle the truth. You're passive aggressive. You can't handle confrontation. You're going to screw up the business and lose customers. Marty needed Ike to help maintain and grow the business. Pretty soon, Dr. Ike installed himself as president of Associated Fabrics. For some reason, Dr. Ike insisted they keep their business space in Manhattan, though they could definitely not afford it. And Marty had found a more affordable warehouse space in New Jersey. Marty lost $1.5 million investment dollars in 1995, recommended by Dr. Ike, in a company called the Bennett Funding Group, a company that filed bankruptcy after being found out as the largest Ponzi scheme in U.S. history at the time. And one of the stranger things he had him do, Dr. Ike insisted that Marty transcribe his handwritten books, something like 12 of them, maybe in an attempt to keep Marty busy. Who knows? The books have not been published, or at least not that I could see. As it turns out, all gravy trains must eventually reach a destination. In 2010, Marty went inpatient at a local hospital to repair a hernia. It was a difficult surgery, and despite the fact that Dr. Ike called them brothers, best friends for 40 years, Dr. Ike couldn't be bothered to call and check in on his supposed best friend or, I don't know, go visit him in the hospital. And that was the final straw for Marty Markowitz. It devastated him, and he began to question the entire basis of their friendship. I'd say that's probably a good thing, since the basis of that relationship was uh, manipulation and theft. Even though Marty didn't really have any friends or family support at this time, he made a move. Using the cognitive skills that Dr. Ike had unwittingly actually taught Marty, he wrote him a letter. He told him he wanted to take a break. Dr. Ike wrote back, warning that Marty would lose his business to manipulative employees and that he was making a terrible mistake. Yeah, I'm fairly certain those employees didn't cost Marty millions of dollars like Dr. Ike did, but maybe that's just me. Marty, who by some miracle of mental fortitude actually removed himself completely from Dr. Ike's manipulative spell, and then he was ready to seek some justice. In 2012, he filed a complaint, his first one, with the New York State Department of Health. And it turns out that Marty was probably not Dr. Ike's only victim. Several other patients have made similar claims of manipulation, including a woman named Judith, who alleges that Dr. Ike manipulated her into going no contact with her mother and also convinced her not to go to her mother's funeral. Others have alleged that Dr. Ike also convinced them to change their wills to benefit him and his family. Wow, he seems like such a nice guy. Anyway, in many ways, Marty was destined to be swept up into the cult that was Isaac Hirschkopf. And even if it was a cult of one, a cult of personality or something else, it was a cult nonetheless. According to cult psychologist Robert J. Lifton, destructive cults are led by a charismatic leader who is authoritarian and who demands to be revered as a godlike figure. The leader must engage in thought reform or mind control. And lastly, there has to be some kind of exploitation of the members. Well, there you go, Dr. Ike, a cult of one. And according to cult recovery psychiatrist Rachel Bernstein, there are three reasons people join cults. First, they want to better themselves. People typically go to see psychiatrists to better themselves. Marty was no different. He was feeling overwhelmed and needed to develop better cognitive skills to help cope with mounting life pressures. Ike exploited the hell out of that one, didn't he? Next, they want a greater sense of community. Marty was looking for a community. He was looking for a sense of family. Ike managed to take all of his family away from him while inserting himself as the only family member that mattered. And lastly, and most importantly, they are in an extreme state of vulnerability. And lastly, possibly most importantly, they are in a state of extreme vulnerability. In 1981, when Marty was introduced to Dr. Ike, he had just lost his parents. He was overwhelmed with responsibilities of a massive family business and the inner family struggle for control of that company. His fiancé was gone. Marty would later say he felt he had no choice. 
Dr. Ike's hold over him was irresistible due in large part to his vulnerable mental state. Dr. Isaac Hirschkopf resigned from the American Psychiatric Association, and in 2019, he voluntarily resigned from NYU's medical school as well as from FASPE, the fellowships at Auschwitz for the study of professional ethics, on whose board of directors he sat. Nice. The New York State Department of Health launched a two-year investigation into Dr. Ike's practices, and in April of 2021, his medical license was revoked. At 70 years old, he was found guilty of 16 charges of professional misconduct, including fraudulent practice, exercising undue influence, moral unfitness, and negligence. The New York State Department of Health concluded that Dr. Ike broke minimal acceptable standards of care in the psychotherapeutic relationship. That's an understatement. The decision was based on records and testimony from three of Dr. Ike's patients. Marty was patient A. Ike claims that Marty Markowitz was a willing partner in everything that happened between them, and in a telephone interview with the New York Times, he said that he had planned to appeal the ruling. However, in December of 2021, the State Review Board upheld the misconduct findings. Good. Here's hoping he can't do that to anyone else. Marty Markowitz would tell reporters, It's my 40-year ordeal. It was 29 years under his power and 11 years seeking justice. I finally got it. Marty reached out to reconcile with his sister, Phyllis. When she answered the phone, she said, I've been waiting for this call for 27 years. Marty Markowitz is now in regular contact with his sister after their 27-year estrangement. They traveled to China and biked across Italy together. It took Phyllis's children a while to trust him again, but now he says they're closer than ever. He closed down Associated Fabrics in 2021 at age 79 and officially retired. All I want is a nice, quiet life. I'm going to retire and travel the world with my girlfriend, Marty told a reporter from Bustle. Marty estimates that he spent over $3 million alone in visits only to Dr. Ike over those three fateful decades, and that does not include all the barbecued kosher fare. Any of you Apple TV subscribers out there, there's an honestly stellar show based on this case. It's called The Shrink Next Door. Will Ferrell plays Marty and Paul Rudd plays Dr. Ike. This series is brilliant, especially, honestly, Paul Rudd. I started watching it really feeling like Dr. Ike was a bit like Bernie Tita. If you don't remember, Bernie was that funeral director that got wrapped up in the wealth provided by his elderly buddy and unwitting financier, Marjorie Nugent. Paul Rudd played Dr. Ike in such a way that, at least at the beginning, had me feeling some kind of sympathy or empathy towards him. Like Bernie, maybe Dr. Ike didn't intend to end up rolling in his client's dough, living in his house, and isolating him from all his friends and family. But the further the series goes along, the less and less sympathy you feel for Dr. Ike. It becomes clear that he was a Thierry Tilly through and through. Everything that Dr. Ike did was plotted and purposeful. It makes it all the more nefarious that he was a psychiatrist. His entire job was to help Marty develop better cognitive and emotional skills, and instead he warped Marty's brain for his entire benefit. It's a wonder the only thing he lost is his license, and he should consider himself lucky. I will also mention that this TV series is based on a podcast of the same name, The Shrink Next Door, written and hosted by Joe Nacera, a columnist for Bloomberg. Apparently, Joe owned a vacation house next door to Marty's, only Joe believed that Ike was the owner and Marty was the property manager. Once Joe found out that Marty actually owned the house, he started investigating. The podcast with six or so episodes, I think there's a couple of bonuses, requires a subscription to listen to, so I chose not to purchase it. It's my personal conviction that I don't think podcasts should be kept behind firewalls unless it's bonus episodes or something like that, but if you want to take a listen, go for it, and People can earn their money however they want. Thanks for hanging out with me. That guy was a real asshole if you ask me. Next week's mocktail does include more of that spiritless Kentucky 74 that we used in an earlier episode. If you're a mocktail fan and don't have it, I suggest you buy it. I've included the Amazon link in the description box if that's helpful to you and you don't mind helping to fund Jeff Bezos' next jet. If you looked at my Amazon purchase list, you'd know that I would never judge you for that. 
Speaking of the description box, are you having a virtual happy hour soon? I can tell this story or another one for your group. The link to the booking page is also in the description box. Next week, we're robbing a bank, people, robbing a bank. Well, okay, we're not robbing a bank. FBI, whoever's listening, we're just learning about a bank robbery. Just learning. I'll see you next week. And remember, there are always alternatives to destroying someone's life when you're supposed to be making it 